Hello everyone, welcome to the deep dive on the day that it's been confirmed that Liverpool are rehiring, well actually Liverpool aren't rehiring I suppose Michael Edwards, Michael Edwards is coming in as a football CEO of FSG, <laughs> that's what it is about Josh, uh, I'm joined by you for this one of course, um, having written a book recently called Data Game, available from all good publishers and some <laughs> um, nefarious ones as well, um, <laughs> On Liverpool's data thing, I thought, what better way? We, we cancelled the Alexi McAllister show. We thought we'd talk about Michael Edwards instead. And on the surface of things, what were your first feelings uh, when you found out uh, that Michael Edwards will be returning? Very, very excited. Uh, great, great news for me. Like, I mean, this kind of stuff is, is generally viewed as a bit boring, isn't it? From, from maybe the typical... Yeah, it's mad, because I love it. <laughs> yeah, so do I. I think it's so important, so I really do. I, I, I think... The, the people at the top of the chain who you don't actually hear much from are so responsible for the decisions that get made day to day in terms of the players that you sign, the people who you appoint, directions to go in and, all, and you know, the kids that get spotted in your academy and get progressed through the ranks and stuff. It, it all stems from your, your key decision makers yeah. and the structure, structure that's in place and stuff. And Edwards has proved himself over the past decade or so to be an absolute master operator when it comes to making smart decisions, um, building the squad, just everything. I mean, he, he, he's got like a really, virtually a flawless record, hasn't he? Yeah, well, I think when you think back to Liverpool in the, the late noughties, um, and you think back to Manchester United today, if you're a mess off the pitch, you're generally a mess off on the pitch as well. Yeah. And listen, Guardiola, and the 115 chances, I don't want to talk about all that today, but know that it's at the forefront of my mind always. Um, but Manchester City, before the appointed Guardiola, got the setup behind the scenes, right? Yeah. They got the people in that Guardiola wanted, they covered the money up and they made sure that they were going to be successful for the long term. Um, exactly. So, and that's what happened. And Liverpool, it looks to me like today, I've made the decision that Michael Edwards is the guy to bring us back to the future. And that's essentially what it is. Yeah. Um, well, if, if you get the process right, mate, everything else kind of falls into place, is what I've found since, like, you know, delving into this kind of subject and stuff. Get the process right and everything else will work itself out. Like, there's, there's loads of examples of clubs who've, who've pumped all kinds of money at their football operation, but the structure is not in place, the people are clueless, they end up going round in circles, like, the, like they've got a like the blind or something and, and they just make no progress sometimes they go they get worse you know Ch Ch look at Chelsea Chelsea have spent like a billion since since Todd Bowley came in and they've appointed all kinds of these executives and all that they haven't got a clue what they're doing yeah. they haven't got any better comes from the top man Todd Bowley yeah if you look at clue. Everton Everton's a good example Machiri comes in loads of money start throwing at the players they haven't got a clue what they're doing so yeah. they end up getting worse they end up fighting for relegation Man United similar Loads and loads of money at, at, at players. If you've got your process right and your key decision makers in place who know what they're doing, you don't go and spend 90 million on, on Anthony. Mm. You don't appoint Ole Gunnar Solskjaer because he's won that five games in a row and keep him in charge for three years. You don't go and sign Cristiano Ronaldo because of sentiment. That That's the process that, that you have to get in place. And Liverpool, when Edward was here, that process was immaculate. It's nice to see that now that Klopp's leaving just re-establish the process that, that delivered success then. Right, absolutely, and it's going to differ, we know that now. He's going to be the CEO of football uh, for FSG. Yeah. And it's highly likely, I think, that FSG starts to explore the multi-club ownership thing. And I don't like it, to be honest. I, I don't think it's good for football in general. Okay. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think you can have true competition across... Europe and across the world where personally um, there is one club that's always going to be the dominant factor in that. Like What I do understand is that I think that it's a good thing that FSG are pursuing it because it's better for Liverpool, but I do not like it. I do not like it at all because mm. I just don't think... I like competition and competition should be fair and I think multi-club ownership goes against that fairness personally. Yeah, it will help Liverpool. Ultimately. Yeah, it probably will. Yeah, I think for the most part, for me, it just it depends how you do it. It, it depends on 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 how you use it, basically. And I don't think it makes that much sense to do 
Well, that, it does. I, I'm going to say City then. City, you know, taking over the world, basically. Obviously, I can see why they're doing it, to just to explore these markets and things like that. But I think if Liverpool do it, if FSG do it, it, <clears throat> it won't be too many clubs. It'll be probably one. And it'll be with a view of maybe replicating what uh, Red Bull have done a little bit. I think Red Bull inspired Kirby a little bit. Uh, Michael Edwards of, went over and spent time at Salzburg yeah. while, while he was discussing building Kirby, didn't he? So, yeah, of course, that's going to be yeah. at the forefront not, of his thinking. I know Liverpool have been interested, like kind of inspired by Red Bull's ability to poach players from the likes of Africa and, and, and places like that. That's something that I, I remember speaking to someone around the book who, who said that was initially going to be something that War, Julian Ward was going to be doing. But then it got binned or something, something to do with exploring Africa as a, in, in a scouting capacity or something like that. So it depends where this club, this multi-club thing, where this club's going to be. <clears throat> if it's going to be in Europe competing for the Champions League, potentially with Liverpool, if it's going to be much, much smaller. Could be anything. So I, I think off the top of my head, I think there was rumours a couple of, a, a little while ago, sorry, uh, of Michael Edwards exploring the possibility of buying a Portuguese football club with a view to tapping into the South American market. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. That wouldn't surprise me at all, yeah. Exactly the but, same. But because that's a, essentially a European unmined mm. field, isn't it? You know? But when you think about that, it does sound attractive, doesn't it? It's attractive <laughs> some of the, some of the from America, a Liverpool though. football club point of view. And I'm a Liverpool football <clears throat> club fan. And I am trying to be... Objective. Objective. Mm. I think I just don't like it, yeah. but I can also see the benefits for Liverpool. Yeah, I, I don't think, as I said, I, I think it's okay if, if, if depending on the club that you acquire and, and the plans and the expectations and that. I think I think it's a bit wrong to acquire a club and basically kill the club essentially. But say for example, Brighton, Brighton have done it. You know, um, Michelin's owner is the same owner as the owner of Brentford, yeah. uh, Matthew Benham. They've done it. So. But they've only got one. They've got Brighton, they've got, they've got the Premier League club and they've got the, the one extra one. One's in Denmark, Tony Williams is in Belgium. Liverpool's could be could be anywhere, I don't know. But I do think it makes sense if you use it well. Like, Look, listen, the, listen for, uh, I think the City group or whatever they're called, City Football Group, CFG, I think it is, something like that. Mm. They're probably the biggest that everybody knows now. Probably the best well ran one, maybe, or the most well ran well ran one is the Red Bull Group. Mm. There's a clear pathway for people coming from emerging markets in terms of football um, to go into the first team of a big football club, and I think that's what Liverpool would essentially be the yeah. last stop on a, on, a, on a series or a train. Now, it wouldn't surprise me because of our ownership to have an MLS team at some point in the future. Yeah, as an actual proper footballing entity that doesn't have anything to do with Liverpool, and I'm okay with that. I actually understand that. You're never really going to compete against an MLS team. You're not going to get into Champions League games against them, for example. You know, but and then and then then my brain starts spinning, Josh, because I'm like, Peter Moore's announced Santa Barbara FC mm. in the next division down from MLS that that's going to go into place in, I think it, he announced it in 2022, the launch in 2025 for Santa Barbara FC, a men's and a women's team, with the view, I'm assuming, of getting into the MLS at some point through an expansion. Mm. There's also Ian Air over there, who's a director of one yeah. of the teams over there as well. Like, if they're getting it all bang back together, and Michael Edwards <laughs> is there, and Peter Moore's started himself a football club over there, maybe, maybe America is a market they'll look to explore. Maybe it's not just football. Maybe it's had a football operation to begin with, but then it expands to sport because the data and the knowledge that these guys have can be yeah. used in different areas of the field. And it, it, I've gone massively off, to off topic here because the <laughs> no, multiple like ownership is, is not something I even mentioned on there. But then you can sort of think, well, Portugal, South American players, yeah, Red Bull, Africa, all that type of stuff. You can see the benefits of Liverpool. And I think that leads into the question, how do you think this role will differ from his previous role? Well, his previous role was, was obviously really hands-on. It was day-to-day. -day. He was at Anfield. Um, he was directly responsible for recruitment, taking part in recruitment meetings and <clears throat> I think ultimately making the final decision really would clop screen light on, on who to sign and things like that. Mm -hmm. This role seems more 
<clears throat> basically Mike Gordon's role, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, where he's kind of higher up. Um, whatever sporting director comes in will kind of like lean on him a little bit, maybe. Um, and use his contacts potentially or something like that. But I, th I think I would view it as almost Edwards going from a, a club manager to a national team manager. Okay. You know, in, in that sense where like you're not anywhere near as busy. Uh, well, not busy, but like, you know, just... You set in the direction yeah, without he, having to do the nitty gritty. Yeah, he's he's he said like how intense the job is, and I completely I completely get it. And he did do it for a decade, like ten years of it. Like say for example me, like just a, you know complete side note, I have been a, a writer now for like f five, six, seven years or something like that. I'm now in a, a, at a point in my career where I'm doing videos more. I kind of prefer this. A lot of the time than writing. If you was to say to me, do you want to keep writing loads and loads and loads of articles again? I'd probably be a bit more like, well, I'd rather do a bit more of this, I think. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I think he seems like that type where, like, he he, he wants that. Like, when he left, he, he, he in his, like, his letters to Liverpool supporters, it was very, like, I want, I believe in change and stuff. And um, so I think that's kind of what he's after. And, you know, you mentioned Red Bull earlier. Red Bull have kind of established, like, a almost like a graduate scheme, like a university thing. Like, you know, you're in school, then you're in college, then you're in university. Then you move to Liverpool if you're good enough. Um, but they've got like Leifrink, you know, who, you know, you, you've got like, kind of like a feeder club there almost. Then you move to Salzburg if you're good enough. Then if you move to Salzburg and you play well enough, you move to Leipzig. And if then, you're good enough, you go to Bayern Munich? <laughs> yeah, or Liverpool, I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the end of the yeah, road yeah, there, isn't yeah. it? But, um, I think that's that's kind of what Liverpool maybe would be interested in establishing your own kind of network. Because if Liverpool send out Rhys Williams on loan, you are reliant on that club to use him. He was a, where did he go? Where it didn't work? Was it Aberdeen or Bristol City or something know. like well, that? Well, this is a, you, you, your point spot on. I think because you are too reliant reliant on the other team playing the way that you play and using the player and how you want him to be used to develop. And it, I think Liverpool have got better at this over the years of sending people out on loan and alone actually becoming worthwhile. Mm. Um, but if you own that football club, then you know exactly how the coaches are taught. It's the same almost in a lot of ways as what will Liverpool have in their own house now. It's the unders playing up through all the age groups to the academy, to the first team. Everyone singing from the same hymn sheet. All the coaches know exactly what the aim of these players in ten years' time is. How do we get them there? Yeah. Except you are now making it easier for them to go and get professional football against people that that, that they consider good enough to improve the player. Yeah. That's just not in the under system because it doesn't exist because of you know you, you I don't know whether you're old enough to remember this but reserve football used to be better probably for the development of those players than the youth football because you can play against your under 23s or your under 21s or your under 18s but you're only playing an age group you're playing 15 years of age group of men's football mm. like you, you're playing the best of the best across 15 years not the best of the best of someone who's the same age as you it just doesn't translate that next step is so difficult to to take that you need real <coughs> football yeah like an ex another example is like some Liverpool supporters have a tendency to like if you if you buy a player for a lot of money who was already moved to Brighton, some some people say like why didn't you just get him when he was in South America? McAllister is a good example. We signed Alexis McAllister, sorry Brighton signed Alexis McAllister from Argentinos Juniors, I think. He stays there on loan for the remainder of that season. Then he goes on loan to Boca Juniors. Further down the line, we finally see him in the Premier League. He looks boss. Looks like Brighton have won at the gem. If Liverpool were to sign that initial Alexis McAllister, he doesn't play for Liverpool, he's not good enough. If you've got a feeder club, you just keep him in your network until he is good enough and then he plays for Liverpool. Yeah. So it does make sense and I can see why Edwards wants to be a part of that kind of bigger growth, that bigger development. And the fact he's been appointed, in addition to it being good for Liverpool's future, is just good for Liverpool evolving as like a you know this network that we that we want them to be because it can only benefit you. Absolutely. I just want to say thank you to Veronica who sent us a super chat to say great news that he's returned to our football club. I think we'd all agree with you there, Veronica. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, so I want to focus a little bit more just on Edwards. How highly in the industry is he regarded? Very. Uh, it's. I must admit, it's a difficult one to talk about because he's renowned for wanting to be. Anonymous. He hates being a story. Um, shuns the limelight, and 
<clears throat> I've been to football conferences with him, sat next to him and stuff, and he has a with him. Well, you were near I've him. Been near at the it. same football conference, you I didn't have a ball on the I don't like that too. I could smell him and everything was did, great. Did mate, you yeah, touch him? <laughs> I didn't, but I was tempted to. <laughs> did you sniff him? <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> where, where, where was I then? You've been to a football conference that, yeah. and you yeah, showed the limelight. Well, he has like a and fake name. Didn't touch him or sniff him. He has like a fake name and everything. Does but, he? Yeah? yeah, like he doesn't want to be. You know, what did it say? Joe Blocks. He has a different one every time. Does he? Do you think there's something in that? Well, he just not, doesn't want to be noticed. He wants to be anonymous. He wants to be under the radar and stuff. And but but despite that, he's a proper network. You'd be gutted if he turned up and he had Josh Williams <laughs> on his fucking name tag. <laughs> I'd be made up to be honest, mate. I think. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'd, uh, it, what, what was I saying? Then? You've sent me again. <laughs> Sorry, mate. I can't help you this but, time. Oh yeah, despite being a, um, that kind of person, he's a real networker as well. Though. It's it's kind of the media side that he's young, but like he. That doesn't mean he's shy or something like that. He's been offered plenty of jobs since he's been out of work. United, Chelsea, PSG, been rumoured. Yeah, kinds. yeah, just a lot. And um, he's turned them all down. And the interest in him is because of what he's established at Liverpool. Like he's, it's not just a case of like he's bought a few good players for Liverpool. When he got to Liverpool, we didn't have an analysis department. He established that. Hired Ian Graham. We didn't have a data science department. He hired Ian Graham to establish that. Takes part in their recruitment meetings and that. Challenges Rogers all the time, and they clash a little bit and stuff. Signs for Firmino. Yeah, signs for Firmino when Rogers wants Spenteke. So they make a compromise and get the same player in the same summer. Um, funnily enough, one, one of the little side notes on that when Rogers was saying, "I want Spenteke," uh, Edwards suggested Lukaku as a compromise, but but Rogers said no. Um, that was alright because if if he if we'd have got Lukaku, we'd have got a clap. <laughs> yeah. So sliding those moments. Yeah, but that would have been interesting though because Lukaku, Lukaku is a good striker, mate. Lukaku is a good player, but whether he's a club player is a different question. But that's interesting anyway. But I think it it will be interesting now to see like what a Liverpool operation looks like when Edwards just has full control if that's what he's got. Because um, when it was when it was Klopp. <clears throat> You can only have so much control when Klopp's in the, in the room. Mate. He's just like a godlike figure at Liverpool, isn't he? And before that, Rodgers was a nightmare for him. Um, so to see him now in a position where he's kind of top of the chain, you'd like to think Liverpool are not going to make a single mistake. But hmm. it's, not, it's not as simple as that, is it? I, I do think there was an interesting story. I can't remember if it was in The Athletic <laughs> that I read. Um, it might have been. Where they spoke about how he looked at and analysed managers' transfer windows. I don't know whether you've seen this one. And the three play the three managers that Liverpool were looking at when we hired Jürgen Klopp and Edwards' shortlist essentially were Jürgen Klopp, Carlo Ancelotti and Eddie Howe. Mm. And the reason they didn't pursue Carlo Ancelotti, although he ticked all of the boxes in terms of winning things, European experience, everything else, was he actually weighed more the transfers of their year three, four and five as the most important transfers they make because Edwards realised that in years three, four and five, the manager has more control over the transfer policy of the football club because their power naturally increases during their time at the football club. Yeah. Which is mad to think because what he's essentially saying is when you come into a football club, you've you've got to play with the lads around you. Essentially, mm. you've got to go, all right, you're my director of football, you've got the research department, I've kind of got to go with you. But in years three, four and five, you've been there long enough and established yourself long enough that your voice is heard more. So he judges them on those years, and that was one of the reasons they didn't go for Carlo Ancelotti because of those transfers, not the early year ones. Yeah, that is interesting. And it's actually what happened <clears throat> with the egg. And if you just play that scene out, and you know, by year five, is Edwards on his way? Yeah, yeah, that's. And that's, the manager's got more and more control as it's gone along. Yeah, that is interesting. Like I've never heard that story. I don't think, but um, it does make sense. And and you know, even adopting data to kind of recruit Klopp in a way and, and you know there's that famous story isn't he where he nearly gets relegated in his final season Liverpool apply numbers to his case to determine whether he's good or bad and he was just unlucky um, and Edwards is, is is one of them kind of data literate um, football people if you want to who can have a convo with both sides whereas a lot of people because he was a footballer yeah, growing up a lot of people side towards one side so yeah, he's kind of the complete package, really. 
Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, we know he hasn't sat on his laurels yeah. since he last year, but we know he's he's had fun turning down the likes of Chelsea who offered him the sort of head of CEO, probably, I think it was, um, of Chelsea. We know Man United wanted them pre their takeover stuff, I think it was. Um, and we know he set up Ludonautics with Ian Graham and a fella from Statsbomb whose name I can't remember. Do you know this one? The direct, uh, what would they be, the chief data officer was a fella who was the yeah. data guy from yeah. Statsbomb for about three years or something like that. Yeah, um, I know what you mean. I, yeah. I forget his name. He's he's on their he's on their website. <laughs> if you just scroll down to the bottom, I think he had four years running basically Statsbomb's data team. Which if you don't know Statsbomb and you and you with us and deep dive, where have you been? Uh, because we talk about this stuff all the time. This guy here up there, yeah, Dinesh oh, Van yeah, Varney, yeah. yeah. chief data officer, Statsbomb head of data science. Um, we we now know as well that he's stepping down from his position at Ludonautics. Yeah. Um, June the 1st to take over the role of a football CEO um, and I imagine that's because of Ludonautics working with a British football club already that will, that yeah, will well, have to have been the case there's um, naturally a conflict there <coughs> so he, you know, he's, got to, he's got to do that but he's not sat on his laurels and I think that's the sort of point of this is that actually what him and Ian Graham and Dinesh Vetvani have tried to achieve with Paul Jackson the uh, Chief Technology Officer is that they will have learned a lot at Liverpool and these mad scientists will have gone, what's next? And I think that's the interesting part for me. We're not just getting a guy to do the same job as he did last time. This is a guy who's trying to push the boundaries of what can be done. And all right, we're not going to have Ludonautics behind it. But he's in those conversations. He knows what the future is, not just what the past is. Well, one of the interesting things with Ludonautics is that that's not a new thing at all. This is in my book, you know, there's a, a paragraph, basically, a, a chapter dedicated to it, where, like, what you'll find in the football world is a lot of data scientists who, who do work in the space, get experience of setting up departments or whatever, get to a point fairly soon where they leave. And they leave because they don't get listened to. They don't get empowered. And they've got all this data, all this intelligence, but then the guy at the top is making decisions because of his own ego, a good feeling, a relationship that he's got with an agent or something like that. So they end up leaving. Um, Sarah Rudd did that with, with Arsenal, kind of, sort of. Um, Javier Fernandez with Barcelona. Um, Luke Bourne with Roma. There's, there's, there's loads of examples. And when Ian Graham announced that he was leaving Liverpool, that was my fear. My fear was a Liverpool deviating from the data-driven decisions it, as Klopp kind of got the keys now. Um, so it looks now to me like Klopp's leaving. FSG want to go maybe back to the beginning to re-establish that initial model of data at the forefront. The guy at the top is the smart one and he makes the decisions and, and, and everyone kind of coincides with that. And It's interesting that Richard Hughes, for example, is, is linked, just one of Edward's best mates, known each other for a long, long time. They are not going to clash, they're not going to conflict, they're going to listen to each other come to a common ground. Hopefully they'll appoint a manager who's, who's similar like that. And then you, you end up making really good decisions all the time in the market, especially because everyone's aligned then. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it feels like we're kind of going back to go forward a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the Richard Hughes is interesting, isn't it? The Richard Hughes stuff, obviously, I, I think they were together when he was uh, Michael Edwards was maybe head of analytics, was he? Um, or an analyst maybe probably just an analyst I think at Portsmouth mm. when Richard Hughes was a player there and they struck up a friendship didn't they and obviously we know that Richard Hughes has gone on to be a very good director of football who's well thought of in Bournemouth maybe not the exciting name that Liverpool fans would want but if there's a relationship there and um, then you can trust that they'll work well together. I think he has done some good deals. I think that Dom Slanky deal at the time didn't look good. Now, actually, it looks very, very good. And actually, some of the players they brought through under his stewardship and, and sold are actually some of the best deals that he's had, rather than you looking at the likes of the Brad Smiths and all that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, re it's really interesting that these two are coming in as a pair. I think, you know, for me, it's always felt like if Liverpool want to get the next guy in, they have to sort the director of football stuff out first. It's felt like one's led to the other. Um, rather than a director of football coming in when the manager's already in, he's exerting his power in an empty room. And it's naturally just going to fill up. Yeah. And then when the director of football walks in, it's like, well, there's only a little corner here for me already. He's only been in like two months or something. Whereas yeah. the director of football comes in, 
and then exactly what you've said, you are setting it out for the next ten years of how Liverpool is going to be run. Well, again, that's that's what felt wrong, <clears throat> you know, last summer. Schmadke, Klopp appointing them basically by the sounds of it, and, and Klopp already being in the building. You're not going to come in with any level of authority when Klopp's already here. He's been here for like eight, nine years. He's a god, messiah, and that. So, you know, it, that, that that dynamic felt weird when it was like, you know, it was Liverpool going to appoint and Klopp was trying to make out that it wasn't his appointment and stuff. But now that Klopp's leaving, it does give Liverpool, it does give FSG this opportunity to, as I said, just kind of restart. And um, <clears throat> I think that his name in isolation, which is huge, I, I must admit, I don't know too much about him, but the fact he has that relationship with Edwards and the fact that Liverpool's um, kind of infrastructure in terms of the programmes that Ian Graham established and all that stuff, that, that is all still in the building. They haven't lost that because Graham's left. That's yeah. like intellectual property owned by the club. So, and they've still got data scientists in there. So Hughes will go in with Edwards above him, who has experience of using these platforms. Yeah, Spearman's still there. Spearman's still there, the scout is still there, Barry Gunson and, and Dave Fallow. So I think Hughes will just immediately feel like he's got everything at his disposal to do really, really well. Um, and I think anyone who's who's a smart operator should do well with them resources at, yeah. the, at the disposal. So I, I've got no worries about it. No, absolutely. And I think obviously, you know, we talk about the structure post clop. I think this is now the time when we're really, truly, honestly going to see um, the fact that the, the 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 coach, the manager, becomes the coach. Yeah. And I think, to be honest with you, I think that's the right decision, Josh, because, mm. you know, long gone are the days of a football manager being able to have enough time in the day to manage your transfers, your scouts, fucking training and play games of football. There is so much data, so much science, so much information involved in running a football club now. that, yeah. And on top of all of that, you haven't got the time of the day, but also you've got the best coach in the world down the road. In some in some people's minds, in Pep Guardiola, mm. you can't be eighty percent a coach and compete with Pep Guardiola. You've got to be a hundred percent on it yeah. on what you're doing day to day, and that power will naturally grow. I think they'll get listened to more over the course of years, of course. But if the manager walks through the door, the coach can be the coach, and I won't see the true continental model. Yeah, well, I think one of the reasons Liverpool <coughs> went the way they did under Klopp <coughs> was because it got to a point where Klopp was no longer really the coach, that was Linders. Yeah. So Klopp becomes the sporting director. But initially when Klopp first comes in, Klopp benefits from the sporting director because Klopp's, Klopp's on the training field every day um, doing the coaching. So it, it does feel like it's the modern way of doing things. And, and you know, sometimes when you say this sort of thing, someone points out that Shankly used to do it and he, and he coped just fine. But, it's you know, but game. back then, mate, you, you had no sports science back then. You, you know, you had, how many demands did you have in a football club back then compared to now? Like it's... The, the the manager now would have to be yeah the manager now would have to deal with so much outside of the actual coaching on the pitch so it makes sense to upon, upon a, get a structure in place where the manager is the coach and he deals with the football side of things and takes part in recruitment meetings and offers his opinion on what he needs and that and all of that kind of laborious stuff gets done by the director of football and and maybe Edwards above him helping out. Yeah, it feels like Liverpool have got the very own Triforce if you're a Zelda fan. Uh, anyway, is Abby Alonso the final piece of the puzzle? Then? <coughs> well, that's that, that's going to be interesting. Here's a question for you. Go on. What if Edwards doesn't like Xavi Alonso? I guarantee you <laughs> he will like him. I guarantee you that. But the issue, I have looked at this recently on my, on my sub stack for the past couple of weeks. I've been looking for a manager using data and stuff, and obviously my stuff's nowhere near as complex as what they're going to use. But Xabi Alonso definitely looks good in the data. One million percent. So there's no worries there. He's an up-and-coming coach. He's, he's going to be a champion, I think. He's um, unbeaten <laughs> in every competition this season. nearly got him. Yeah, I I know, nearly got yeah, him. Yeah, did, yeah, to be fair, but that's still not still in it. That yeah. is crazy, that. So, there's no concerns there. The, the problem, if you want to call it a problem, is the sample size. Sometimes, especially when it comes to data and FSG and all that, it is about making decisions based on evidence. Whether they think they have enough evidence yet on Alonso is a question mark, because you've got double the evidence, treble the evidence with Nigelsman. And with Amaran, 
for example. They're both champions as well. Um, both got really good data. Um, we know how much Liverpool seems to like Portugal for whatever reason, scouting over there and that. Amram's doing brilliance over there, has been doing brilliance over there for five years now. So, if it's not Alonso, it will be because he doesn't want it or because Liverpool want to go with someone who they think is more proven. But if Alonso goes and wins the Bundesliga with them numbers behind him, I mean, he's still relatively proven. Like, so. And listen, Klopp was signed off similar things, wasn't he? Yeah. Where, you know, all right, it's more of a data sample to choose from, but winning the Bundesliga will have got no... Will have quelled any fears, I suppose, in a couple of years. Yeah. One thing with Klopp, though, Klopp did have 14 years behind him as a manager. Alonso's got not even two yet in the senior game. Uh, if you're excluding Vale, so she'd not be. So there's an element of risk there. And that's the, that's the thing. With, with, it'll be interesting to see how we, how we go in this data driven era now, with Edwards in charge and Hughes underneath him, maybe. and the manager being the coach and stuff like that, because decisions will be completely objective. There'll be no sentiment, rightly so as well. So, for example, the fact Alonso played for Liverpool, irrelevant. I don't even think it'll be factored in. And yet, there's one matter. football club in the world where that might matter more than any of the others. <laughs> yeah. Liverpool Football Club. Yeah, I know. Because it definitely it does matter to us. Yeah, I can understand why the man on the street right would think it's, it matters, but it doesn't. It really, it, bottom line is it doesn't. I think it, it will get supporters on side initially, but if Amram goes and wins his first five games 5 0, supporters are on side. Doesn't matter. The bottom line is that the coach is good. Alonso's good, so it doesn't matter. But that appointing someone because they know the club, nonsense. Nonsense, you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, that has been the deep dive. He's been Josh Williams <coughs> and Chris Pajak. Uh, thank you, everybody who's joined us live for this one. A uh, big thank you to Victoria as well, who sent the super chat in earlier on. Um, really appreciate the fact that people seem to really love this show. Um, and yeah, we'll be back next week with another pair of deep dives. That's right. Hey, thank you so much for checking out the content today. If you want to get your name in and amongst these wonderful people, uh, then head to redmenplus.com. Join as a legend tier subscriber. You're going to get free merchandise, merchandise codes. You're going to get in our Discord, and you're going to get your name at the end of YouTube videos. Yes, redmenplus.com, legend tier status.